Thank you so much for your fantastic introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today and uh, to tell you a little bit about my research. Um, like many of you, I'm, I'm really interested in understanding how the brain works and more specifically, I want to understand how a network of neurons implement neural computation. So today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, so to, to understand this neural computation, I wear a few different hats as a theorist. My goal is to build relatively simple mathematical models and frameworks that allow us to reason about the behavior of neural networks. I'm interested in how perceptual decision making and working memory are implemented and how ongoing dynamics can support learning of temporal dependencies. As a statistician and a machine learning researcher, my goal is to build advanced data analysis methods to analyze specifically designed for neural time series that reflect the underlying neural dynamics and computation. I'm interested in inferring low dimensional uh, population state evolution and the underlying dynamical law associated with such behavior of individual neurons and also the, the population activity. And as a neurotechnologist, I develop tools that can both help experimentalists and biomedical engineers. I am interested in tackling the problem of real-time monitoring and control of uh, neural population states, and also interested in disorders of consciousness. Okay, for the interest of time, I'm only going to be talking about a couple of lines of research. Today, in the first part, I'll talk about uh, theory and data analysis methods for analyzing some cognitive behavior. Uh, in the second part, I'll talk about how to infer neural dynamics from ensemble of, of neural time series and also how to interpret them, how to model them such that they are easier to in interpret. Okay, so let's dive into the part one. Uh, here, my goal is to understand the neural code of the population in terms of their sensory uh, stimulus representation and their behavior, the choice behavior and decision making. In a couple of experiments uh, involving macaques, we found that the internal representation of visual stimulus and the perceptual decision based on this stimulus were paradoxically uh, misaligned. And I'll describe the experiment in a second, but let me first acknowledge the team. This was uh, led by a brilliant postdoc in my lab, Yuan Zhao, and it's a collaboration with Alex Huck's group at UT Austin. Uh, his former grad students, Dr. Yates and Dr. Levy, collected most of the data. And of course, the brain area of interest uh, for for this part is the visual area MT, a very well-known area, the middle temporal area. It's been extensively studied both in terms of its anatomy and its role in uh, visual motion perception. A lot of people have studied uh, this area. And for example, if it, we know that this area is very involved in, in motion processing because if you inactivate MT, as shown in this example, the monkeys can no longer see visual motion and they can they fail to do this uh, simple task of uh, telling which way the visual motion is uh, moving. Um, and traditionally, people have used uh, random dots motion task to uh, probe MT, but today we're going to talk about slightly different uh, stimuli. So we used a stimuli that consists of the seven motion pulses. Uh, each of these motion pulses lasts for 150 milliseconds, and there are these Gabor patches, 18 or 19 Gabor patches, that are either drifting to one direction or just flickering without making any motion. And the animal's objective is to integrate over these seven motion pulses, and if the total motion pulses to one direction, then you have to report it correctly to get rewarded after the go queue. And so it was a fixed duration task. As expected from MT, uh, if you look at single MT units in this uh, case, this is population average, uh, modulation of firing rate of individual neurons. Uh, you can see that they are modulated to, to each pulse, motion pulse, uh, one to seven here. If you look at the first dark red curve, this, uh, this is the modulation of MT spike rate due to a unit of motion pulse from the first motion occurred at the beginning here. Uh, it lasts for a couple hundred milliseconds or longer, but decays away. And it's largest for the first pulse, and it's smaller for the rest of them, which we'll get back to uh, later. Um, so this is great. MT is normal in this, uh, in this new stimuli. Uh, 
But how do we know that the spike rate modulation in MT is actually used to make the decision? So the, to quantify this information usage, consider trials where the stimulus was weak, but identical and repeated. Uh, so because the stimulus is weak here, the animal's choice from trial to trial are variable in this case. And it, if the neural code of MT is read out to make the choice decisions, the trial to trial variability in spike counts shown here as an example of a histogram of spike counts, should be correlated with behavior. Uh, the reason is as follows. So if, because the stimulus is identical, this noise or this variation in the stimulus representation should, should cause a bias in the perception on, on a trial by trial basis. So we can build two histograms corresponding to this distribution, corresponding to each choice. And if these two distributions are separated, uh, here shown as red and blue, trials that correspond to eventual choice of left and right, if they're well separated, then it means there's a lot of information, uh, the correlation between these spike counts and the behavior. And this, this is quantified traditionally with this quantity called choice probability or CP. And I'm going to talk a lot about CP. So uh, CP is basically, a, if, if the two histograms are completely separated, the red and blue histograms are completely separated, then the CP is one. It's uh, you can read out the animal's behavior from a single trial by count. If it's 0.5, it's at uh, chance level. Then the red and blue histograms will be overlapping completely. Um, so it's well known in MT that single neuron choice probability is at around 0 0.55, 0 0.54 in that range. Um, which is which is a small number. Right? It's close to chance, but it's it's significant is its robust signal in MT. And our monkeys, uh, we, had, we had three monkeys that had choice probability around 0.54, uh, which, is, which agrees with the prior studies. So the question here is, if we are motivated by this readout scheme, but does, does having a robust choice probability of 0.54 necessarily mean that they're being read out, right? So there are a couple of complications here. One is that this feedforward origin of choice probability due to reading out of MT's uh, variability is complicated by the existence of population correlations within MT. And there has been a um, rich discussion in the literature about theoretical structure of these uh, correlations. And, and more recently, there, there has been uh, ideas of additional origin of CP. It does not have to originate from this readout uh, path, but could be a top-down kind of uh, feedback. Here, the decision-making process that's integrating this evidence from MT could be sending back some of this decision signal or motor preparatory signal back to MT. Or it could be that some form of uh, feature-based attention or expectations uh, of, of the task manifest as some top-down top input to MT that causes bias in the, in the choice in a trial-by-trial -trial basis. So there has been theory about this, and there has been some evidence studying uh, the time course and pairwise correlation uh, of MT neurons. But we could make a stronger case, case if we had access to populations of neurons. And that's exactly what the Hug Lab was able to do with using these linear probes. Uh, they were able to get tens of neurons up to 20, 24 or so simultaneously recorded MT units. And this is a, a this may seem like a small number uh, in rel relative to the more recent other areas recordings, but in MT, this is uh, quite a big number because it's uh, located deep inside a sulcus. Um, this ensemble data allows us to do two things. One, to better access the population correlation structure and improve uh, the signal to noise ratio uh, uh, for estimating choice probability. So we can do this by using um, statistical modeling techniques. And the one that we're going to use is developed by uh, Yuan Zhao and myself. It's called the Variational Latent Gaussian Process Model, or VLGP for short. It's a type of factor model. So if, you, you know, if you're familiar with uh, factor analysis or GPFA, the Gaussian Process Factor Analysis, it's a similar model. It's essentially an extension that allows us to uh, use spike trains. It's a type of fancy PCA, in a sense. Uh, so let's consider here uh, 13 
neurons. This is a raster plot of 13 neurons over time, a bunch of spikes. You can think of this as a matrix of zeros and ones. That's, that's how this algorithm uh, looks at this data. And what we're trying to find is, can we ex extract two different components? One is a private spiking variability, which is due to its individual uh, noise. And the second, which is the shared cover uh, covariability that explains across multiple neurons here. So VLGP assumes that there's a smooth firing rate function, a lambda of t, that underlies this matrix of zeros and ones, y, uh, according to some inhomogeneous Poisson process. And so that, that explains away the, the private noise. But the more important part is the shared variability. So I'm showing you here uh, four different color traces over time. The, these four traces are the latent trajectory or the uh, latent factors that's extracted for the single trial. So the firing rate of each neuron is basically a linear combination of these four factors over time, uh, followed by an exponential, exponential nonlinearity. This is a point-wide nonlinearity that makes sure that the firing rate is above zero and the factors interact multiplicatively. So the full model would be a, to explain all the neurons, you'll have a, a loading matrix, which is neuron by four in this example, and four by time. There's a low rank matrix that explains this uh, firing rate. And you want to do this for all trials, right? So if you have many, many trials, you'll have a single loading matrix, and you'll have, uh, for each trial, you'll have individual uh, latent trajectories. Uh, I'm going to call them A and X here. Uh, so the goal of the algorithm uh, to infer this, so this just tells you a model of how, how we can generate data if we had such a factor a representation. To infer, the, the inference problem is given only the spike trains, can we get both A and X, right? A fixed for across all trials and X of T uh, individually for each trial. And that's a pretty ill-posed problem. So what we do here is we assume a, uh, additional assumptions about the x, which is in the form of Gaussian processes. In our case, we're putting some smoothnesses over time with, uh, with a hyperparameter that can control how smooth they are. And we also infer that hyperparameter. In the empty data set itself, the hyperparameter turns out to be about 50 milliseconds or so. So we're trying to capture all smoothly changing things at around the 50 millisecond time scale that all the neurons are sharing and extracting this from the population spike trains and analyzing the factors from now on. So, so instead of looking at the spike trains, we're going to be looking at the four-dimensional uh, signals. So, so the first thing we want to look at is to make sure that this, uh, this captures all the noise correlation that we expect to see. So we have a bunch of frozen trials uh, in, in the task so you can compute the noise correlation between neurons. So in the lower bottom of this matrix are pairwise correlations during the frozen trials. And you can see that the upper half, which is model predicted noise correlation captures, uh, is, is pretty close. This is one of our bigger sessions from one monkey. And here are more sessions from other monkeys. Uh, these are the bigger sessions that I can show you the noise correlation more clearly. You can see that they match pretty well. All right, so now that we have a good representation, a four-dimensional representation in this case, for all, all of the sessions, how, how well does, uh, does it capture both um, the stimulus representation and the choice representation. So first diving into the stimulus representation, uh, we, want, we did a encoding model analysis. So we were trying to do, we tried to predict how much are the factors modulated by the motion pulses. So the first motion pulse, uh, as we saw from single neuron case earlier on, it modulates individual neurons firing rates. In this case, we're looking at how much it modulates each factor. And what we did was to do a regression to factors, then try to find the rotation such that all of the explanatory power by the motion stimulus is in one of the dimensions. And what we found here are, uh, these are three example sessions where factor one is, contains most of the information uh, about uh, driven by the, the motion pulses, and two, three, and four are in, in decreasing order in terms of the power. And you can see that it's highly concentrated on one factor. And this is not only these three sessions, but across the population, this happened a lot. This, this, is, this does not have to happen. Uh, this is not a necessary con consequence of the stimulus being one-dimensional. Stimulus is one-dimensional because 
it's either moving to the left or to the right, right? There's a, there's a single dimensional uh, motion strength. But MT could have been encoding this in a nonlinear way, or it could have been changing its representation as time goes on. It could have had like an adaptive code. So the later pulses are encoded by some other population, other parts of the neural population. So this was a surprising finding to find that this is actually a one-dimensional code in our factors. And from now on, I'm going to call this one dimension the stimulus dimension. So there's one stimulus dimension and three non-stimulus dimensions. And the question is, how do we reason about our, our modeling, uh, reason about where the choice is going to live in this high-dimensional space? I'm going to give you a sequence of POI models um, that, that will help us reason about this. So in this two-dimensional case, uh, I've drawn neuron one and neuron two, but you can think of this as factor one and factor two. Yes. Right. So the analysis we did ignored the actual receptive fields of each neuron. Right. We are just trying to find if the factors are explained by the stimulus because the stimulus. Uh, this was not the mapping stimulus where you had different kinds of motions. The motion was always one dimensional. Right. So. We didn't have to worry about that particular problem of having different neurons having different receptive fields in this case. Okay, coming back to our uh, toy model, um, so just two-dimensional case here. I'm I'm showing you the encoding of a strong rightward motion, for example, and a strong leftward motion. This is the average response. Neuron one likes rightward motion and vice versa. And as you, as we just discussed, there there's like a one-dimensional manifold that encodes the strength of motion. Uh, in, in this axis. And on, this is only the average. On From trial to trial, the neural responses, of course, will be variable. And there will be different directions that we could consider. Um, one important direction is the direction of that's aligned with the stimulus direction. This is sometimes called the information limiting noise because the noise itself looks like the stimulus, right? So if you have this kind of noise, it's pretty bad for you. It, it hinders your way, uh, its ability to have fine discrimination. So you don't want this kind of noise too much. So that 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 kind of noise is there, and then there's the null direction, orthogonal to this. If there's independent noise in this orthogonal direction, then those would be uh, those live in this uh, null space, which could be safely ignored in terms of doing this task. In this task, you only need to tell if it's left or right. So anything that's uh, off, off the stimulus axis, you can project it out. So for example, if you have this green dashed line as your optimal decision boundary, such that you say you know, one side is left, the other side is right, then any variations, any independent noise in the purple direction will be just completely ignored and you'll be fine. So keeping in mind these two different uh, kinds of consequences of noise, we're going to, I will pre present to you uh, uh, some toy models of how choice probability can live in either of one of these two directions, right? So you can have uh, these uh, individual trials, these diamonds correspond to response of a single trial for a, let's say, weak motion, the highly variable uh, behavior. And we're going to try to say what happens if we have different kinds of scenarios? So the first scenario we're going to consider is the optimal readout scenario, where there's this bunch of trials with a bunch of variable uh, neural responses. And according to this green, green line, you're going to color them more black if it's on the right-hand side, if it's color them more red, and if it's on the left-hand side. That will create a separation in the marginal distribution across the stimulus direction. So if you project it to this uh, orange axis, you'll see separation in the red histogram and the black histogram, giving you some choice probability above chance. But on the, the non-stimulus direction, there would be no choice probability because there's nothing that separates those two things. So the optimal monkey, you should ha not have any choice probability in the non-stimulus direction under mild assumptions. Um, if you have a sub-optimal monkey, uh, you might have a bad choice boundary, which works okay-ish, but but not all the time. And you'll be this decision boundary will separate your points in an off-diagonal on, on a diagonal manner, which will give you some choice probability in the non-stimulus direction. But these are the two feed-forward mechanisms that could give you different uh, 
choice probability estimations, then there are two different feedback mechanisms that I'll introduce. The first is the corrupting feedback. So it's similar to the optimal readout, where first what happens is you have the optimal readout uh, axis, things are separated in the horizontal axis here a little bit, but then when the downstream decision-making area is saying, oh, it looks like it's going to be choice B, let's feed back in, into MT and make it look even more choice B, right? This is like a hallucination route. So you'll, you'll be driving the system to making, uh, looking at things that you think you're looking at. So this kind of positive feedback in the stimulus dimension will increase the choice probability in the stimulus dimension. But since it's going to the stimulus dimension and not the non-stimulus dimension, your non-stimulus dimension choice probability will be still at chance. And the last one is the non-corrupting feedback. Feedback is coming in in the same kind of signal, but the signal is not going into the stimulus dimension at all. It's only hitting the purple dimension, separating out in the y di direction. So in these two cases, D and F will have uh, choice probability in the non-stimulus dimension that are above chance. And, and that's exactly what we see. Oops, sorry. What we see, but before we get there, we, we need to talk about a little bit about estimating choice probability. As I introduced choice probability for a single neuron, it's, it's about, you know, it's a one dimensional distribution. But if you have, you know, a population of neurons or in, in, in our case, a three dimensional space, then you need to somehow reduce that to one dimension before you can estimate it. And an easy mistake to make is to just do a regression from your high dimensional observation to your, you know, your behavioral output and use that weight to project your data. If you do that, you're going to severely overestimate choice probability, which is, is a mistake we made very early on. But we corrected it using this uh, cross validated scheme. So what we do is uh, collect all the trials, set some small part of the trials for computing CP and the other part, you know, rest of it to uh, actually estimate this projection from high dimension to low dimension and to make sure that it's regularized enough. So we will estimate the regression from the green trials and then project the blue trials in that dimension, repeat it for all folds, collect all the blue trials, and compute CP. And we can show that if we do this, even if you have you know, irrelevant dimensions added to your, your system, the estimated choice probability will not be overfit. We'll be underfitting it and we'll be underestimating the choice probability. But scientifically, what we want to see is, is, is there choice probability? We don't want any false positives here. Okay, so I'm going to show you uh, some distributions here. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the, the orange distribution is for one choice, blue distribution is for the other choice. Uh, same axis here, this is from monkey L. You can see the orange distribution is sort of shifted to the upper right, mostly to the up direction, which is in, you know captured by this uh, EP of 0 0.61 in the non-stimulus direction, it's above chance. Uh, same for monkey P and monkey N. There are equal or greater amount of choice probability on the non-stimulus direction compared to the stimulus direction here. And to, if you combine all the evidence from all, all sessions, uh, on average, we, we get choice probability of 0.546 for the stimulus direction and much larger uh, choice probability of 0.59 in the non-stimulus direction. And this was... Uh, the largest effect size and also uh, statistically significant. Okay, so this it's I, it's not the optimal monkey that that's, that we got, but it's just feed forward or feedback. That question is not answered from this analysis. So we take a deeper dive into the time course of choice probability. So if you look at uh, the figure on the left, this is uh, aligned at the onset of motion on here at zero. Motion off is at one point zero. Uh, slightly up after one second and the red line is the choice probability in on the stimulus axis it's pretty small but it's above 0 0.5 this was a moving window of 100 milliseconds this is this early choice probability uh is consistent with the with the behavior so if you look at just an, analyzing the behavior to see if the monkey's strategy behavioral strategy is using a different pulses in different ways you do see that the first two pulses uh, shown in the right figure here, are used much more heavily than the rest of the pulses in terms of make, you know, predicting their behavior. 
it makes sense in the feed forward sense that the first two uh, pulses corresponding to the first two pulses you have the most trace probability but this is tiny tiny compared to what we see in the non-stimulus space which is a much larger trace probability unexpected from uh for for mt and un unexpected for from prior prior theories so the almost all prior theories deal with only the stimulus axis they will only talk about noise in the stimulus axis, correlations in the stimulus axis. Uh, but in fact, most of the choice probability is actually not coming from that choice axis. Also, this bump of CP is late during the trial, right? It's during the motion presentation, but it's later during the motion presentation when we know the monkey's not using the information from the motion very much. Uh, so there's some, some delayed response here. This is consistent with the, uh, the theoretical work by Wimmer et al., who, who showed that choice probability for single neurons can be decomposed into a, a bottom-up and the top-down uh, signal. They had some, some modeling studies that showed this is possible, uh, but this is the first time that we, we see this in actual recording. Okay, so brief summary so far. We have visual motion stimulus, which is one-dimensional. We have population recording using our fancy VLGP, we have recovered a low dimensional representation. One of the dimensions was extracting the visual stimulus, and there were two other dimensions, or three other dimensions, uh, that were not in the stimulus, not representing the stimulus directly. And we think that uh, it's a feedback mechanism that's causing a lot of choice probability in this non stimulus dimension that's coming back in a non corrupting way which is good because you don't want your uh, downstream decision-making process to corrupt your own sensory representations. So that made sort of sense, but why, why even have this feedback? That, that was a, that was interesting thing to see. So we wanted to dig a little deeper into this question, and I'm going to show you a little bit of a uh, sneak peek on uh, ongoing analysis here, which are not complete yet. So the Hug Lab has designed a couple more conditions for this particular task uh, and to change the behavioral strategy of the animal. So if you change the behavioral strategy of the animal, does it change the internal representation and how it's related between you know, choice and, and the sensory representations? So uh, the flat condition is the same condition as before. We saw that the animal was using the first couple of pulses more than the other pulses to make decisions. So what, what they did was to uh, have stimulus statistics such that the later three pulses have information about, you know, that you need to use to get reward, but the first three pulses have very little information uh, about, you know, of, of motion information. So uh, the corresponding behavioral uh, psychophysical weights show you, shows that the monkey was indeed using the, you know, motion pulse five and six a lot and did not use one, two, and three very much which makes perfect sense. So the monkey was trained in this new task. Uh, we were hoping to see uh, the learning as, as the monkey was learning this, how does the represent change along the way, but the monkey learned this pretty quickly. So we only have a couple of sessions where it was transitional and then we had stable recordings from the this late waiting sessions. And then we uh, they also had these early conditions come back after a few weeks, uh, there were Bunch of sessions recorded where the motion stimulus was early monkey quickly learned to wait the early uh, pulses to make the decisions so what happens to the corresponding choice probability this was what i showed you before and the late condition and the early condition uh things don't change too much the choice probability is pretty small on the stimulus dimension still and still most of the choice probability is in the non-stimulus dimension, which is quite strange. Also, as you can see from the late condition, uh, early on in the motion on, after motion on, there's choice probability in the non-stimulus dimension uh, when the actual stimulus didn't have much motion information. So this, this definitely is not a uh, stimulus-driven kind of... Uh, bias that in, in the behavior that's present in MT early in the trial, which, which is quite puzzling. And in the early condition, choice probability in the non-stimulus dimension somehow gets uh, somewhat suppressed in the, in the early during the trial, where actually there is a lot of motion information, which is also strange. 
Um, there was also uh, later periods where we had delay. So after the motion off, the monkey had to wait 500 milliseconds to one second. Uh, that during that delay period, there was some significant amount of choice probability. This could be some working memory like uh, signals that are living here. And the largest choice probability to our surprise was after the go queue before the saccade. So from the go queue to saccade is about median 300 milliseconds or so. And the choice probability in the non-stimulus dimension starts ramping up rapidly uh, before that happens. And it goes up to 0.75, which is a number unheard of. And importantly, during this period, there's no visual motion. There's just fixation point disappearing at the go queue. That's all that happened. And MT, which is supposed to be a sensory area, has this huge amount of signal that can be predictive of uh, the saccadic eye movement. This could be uh, related to some expectation of visual motion due to the saccade, or it could be some you know, motor preparatory burst coming back, but it's coming back to MT for some reason. Another striking thing that we saw was the actual representation of stimulus that changed during, during this, uh, these different shapes. The regression told us that the first pulse had the most impact on the representation of MT in the sensory area, uh, in, the, in, in, in the stimulus axis, and in the late condition, where there's no stimulus during the first, you know, very little visual motion during the first three pulses, the normalized impact of motion pulse to modulate these factors actually increased. It became more sensitive to motion where the monkey was not using these motions. And that was also seen in the early condition where suddenly the last three pulses, the MT's representation became much more sensitive to the last three pulses where the monkey's not using these very much and there's not much visual motion, which is very strange. So we still don't fully understand what is going on. And all I can tell you is that this ensemble analysis of decision making is a lot of fun. Uh, and there's a lot happening in the non-stimulus subspace where prior theories have not explored and the prior uh, experiments were not you know, super sensitive to. And CP and MT is mostly in the non-stimulus space. They're misaligned and the peak happens when there's no visual motion some sort of top-down signal. Uh, as, the, as learning happened in this area, the stimulus representation was changing over time. And as you, as you see from our analysis, we have the data analysis tools to get these information. But right now, what we need is uh, more theory and hypothesis, and critically, more experiments to, to verify uh, our hypothesis here. So this is end of part one. It would be a good Time to get some questions. One thing that we're lacking here in, in this experiment is that this is a learning paradigm, right? We're learning to do the task with one stimulus condition, another one, and another one. And we, we never switched back and forth. So the monkey is capable of switching between these tasks pretty quickly. So we could possibly create a task such that within the same session, they would be doing, you know, for this trial, it's a flat condition for this trial, it's an early condition, and so on. In that case, we can probably see uh, faster modulations and, and how they play out in, in this area. That would, be, that would be a very nice experiment to do after this. Right, I mean, it, it, I don't have a full theory that explains all the phenomena here. That's, that's why I'm leaving it as uh, hanging on a little bit. It has to have some sort of adaptation kind of effect. It has to have some sort of uh, attention effect, but uh, it only can this this new theory can only be a hypothesis. That I, that's why I'm not giving you all the details because the data we have right now cannot discriminate between these different possibilities. It could, so it could be uh, adaptation going on that says you know we have weak stimulus here during these trials. I'm gonna ramp up my gain regardless of my behavior. I don't care about these things when I'm actually making decision, but because I'm empty, I'm gonna you know, increase my gain here. I mean, that, so that, that's a great question. And it, it would depend on, depend on the hypothesis. We, this data set, actually, we have uh, a few joint recording with MT and LIP, but we don't have a big population. It's like one neuron in LIP and seven neurons in MT and a few sessions. Uh, so we don't really have a very nice 
statistical power to answer those questions here. But the, the idea there was exactly that. We wanted to see if, you know, more decision-like signals from LIP may help us understand how MT is getting this information in terms of its time course and its, its relationship. Right? Is it causal from MT to LIP's reflection of this decision signal? Uh, and another direction that we're going for here is to decompose the CP component using a GLM-like framework to decompose which part of the CP is coming from, you know, preparatory activity, um, go queue aligned, or is it more coming from motor, motor execution like, or an expectation like saccades? Uh, so we can decompose these different components of CP, uh, which, is, which is another direction that we are actually working on right now. And the preliminary data shows us that this representation, this non-stimulus dimension is actually not one dimensional. We're doing a regression from three dimension to one dimension, but it's actually changing over time. So early on during the stimulus presentation, the CP in the non-stimulus dimension lives in a different subspace than the CP that shows a huge CP that you see uh, later during the Go queue. Uh, they, they seem to be not aligned within the same uh, non-stimulus dimension. So further analysis is required, but yeah, we have, we have pretty good ideas of where we might go. I see a lot of questions in the chat. So I, I would have said if, if uh, in the earlier, one of the earlier toy models, there was this feedback that was aligned with the stimulus that amplifies such an effect, uh, making your decisions, you know, strongly biased, uh, in that case, I would have said that that might be the case, but since we don't see that and the CP is really living in the non-stimulus direction, I'm not sure if that would be the case. But that's that's a good question. We could look at uh, trials with stronger signal versus weaker signal and try to see if the CP distribution is different. What we're, what the, the analysis I showed you were all weak signal trials. So, so that's for sure. So those are easier to analyze because the monkey's behavior is more variable and we can regress out the stimulus component. For strong stimulus, typically the issue is the monkey is doing very well. So there's no variability to estimate any CP out of. So that, that's a practical challenge there. Um, the more the better is my standard answer. Uh, if we had 100 neurons, 1,000 neurons, that would that would be even better. The minimum is hard to say. That depends on signal to noise ratio. So if your neurons are very high firing rate, you know, huge modulations, then having four neurons could give you three dimensional space. Uh, but if your neurons are all the same and they're all low firing rate, then that would be difficult, right? So this, this is really case by case. I would have to say, show me the data. I'll tell you how, how many dimensions I can extract from this. And uh, the limit really comes from statistical power. All right, uh, I'll just try to be quick in the second part, uh, which is statistically even more difficult problem. Uh, in this line of research, my goal is to develop machine learning tools uh, to understand neural dynamics as a continuous dynamical system, which means I want to have some sort of differential equation form x dot equals f of x. So here x is like the four-dimensional neural trajectory you saw before. And what I want to infer is this f, the law that governs how that trajectory should change over time. Um, once we have this kind of form where we extracted the f, then we might be able to better understand how, understand in quotes, uh, how, how neural computation is implemented, get more hypotheses as to, uh, as to these computations and, and test them. And also, Having these inference of these dynamic systems are very important for doing closed loop perturbation studies where you want to say, if my neural state is around here, I want to hit it with you know, optogenetics or something like that. And also next generation clinical devices. Um, you can think of this inference as two steps. Uh, you can start from uh, some single trial data, population recording over time, which you can use these kind of these dimensionality reduction methods such as VLGP, to convert them to a trajectory over space. So you start with some green dot, your trial you know, evolves over time to end at some red dots. This is a simulated study here. That's why it looks so nice, look, looking like a ring structure here. So if you have a bunch of trials, you did this 
you know, reduction, you might get this nice picture and then stare at it and say, oh, I think I see a ring. But we want to go one step further here and say, if I have a bunch of these trials, why can't I just construct the law underlying F, which is these, uh, these arrows here, that say, if you're inside this ring, try to get outside to the ring. If you're outside, you try to get to the ring. If you're at the ring, your speed is very slow. The speed of flow is, uh, is colored here. Um, so you can do this two-step process to get to this uh, map F, this, uh, this neural dynamics as a dynamical system, or we could infer you know, at one step jointly X and F at the same time, which is our preferred way of doing things. But why do we really want to get to this point? It's because it's mainly because it, it gives us um, it gives us access to different tools that and ignores some of the uh, mechanistic details um, that we may not care about too much in terms of understanding the computation at a higher level. Um, many theories of neural computation, like you know, paper and pencil derived theories, are written in this form of dynamical systems, and there are you know, there are high dimensional versions and low dimensional versions, but many of these systems are low dimensional dynamic system that you can exactly design to solve certain tasks in a, in a way. Models of working memory, decision making and perception and whatnot uh, all have this kind of theoretical basis using this language of dynamical systems. And th these, this language really is useful for describing temporal computation. Um, and it really abstracts away from the you know, nitty-gritty details of the mechanistic biological model, more biologically plausible models. So I'm going to give you an example of how these models might you know, help us think. These are models of decision-making and working memory. Here shown as a blue ball is the neural state. This is your x of t at time t. Uh, and this black line is the cartoon of some energy landscape. So if you balance the ball here, Precisely, it'll stay there. But if you push it around, it's going to be, you know, fall down to one of those valleys. Uh, so these points where the ball can stay stationary are fixed points in the language of dynamical systems. And these two, two of them are, are you know, attracting. As in nearby, if you push it a little bit, it'll, it'll come back to that point. So these two fixed points that represent, in this case, decision one and decision two, are point attractors. So as you can see, it gives you a language of describing this uh, computation, in this case, some sort of winner-take-all computation as decision one or decision two wins eventually. Um, and re related models, such as the continuous attractor model, where you have a flat area where you, you can put the ball anywhere here, it'll just stay there. Or a more robust version of it, where you have a sequence of point attractors that you can put the ball in one of these valleys, it'll stay there and it won't, it won't get perturbed by a small amount of noise. But if you have enough motion information or something like that, then it can hop around uh, and make decisions. So all of these theories can be described as you know, uh, a set of fixed points and continuous attractors and so on. So this is, this is what we want to, this is the level at which I want to describe certain kinds of neural dynamics implement in certain kinds of uh, computations. And a lot of people in, in the field in the past have been using uh, linear dynamical systems. I want to just quickly uh, mention that the linear dynamical systems, although we understand exactly what happens, is we have complete theory. It, it, it can do spiral in, it can do spiral out, it can you know, have fixed points and saddles and whatnot. It, it is lacking in its expressive power for um, most of theoretical computational neuroscience dynamics, which contains typically multiple fixed points, maybe a ring attractor, line attractor, or limit cycles and nonlinear oscillations. So uh, we, need, we, we want to move away from linear dynamical systems models and go to a nonlinear system. But in the nonlinear system, there are typically uh, two different regimes. You can have a very high dimensional nonlinear system. You can fit, you know, fancy machine learning recurrent neural nets with thousand neurons and fit, fit your data. Perhaps it explains the data well, it, perhaps it, it predicts the data very well, but it's hard to interpret. So my, my line of research is to go for the low dimensional, as low dimensional as possible, but as complex as possible, right? So if these uh, high dimensional recurrent neural nets are powerful because each of these recurrent relations are very, very simple. But by having a high dimension, it can approximate some complex dynamics. That doesn't mean it's not approximated. 
it's not possible to approximate it by an effectively lower dimensional system with you know much more complex nonlinear dynamics, which is the direction that I'm going for here. So the question here for the low D case is to you know have a good parameterization of this function f that defines the flow. And we want to make sure that the, this function f can you know express all the building blocks of theoretical neural computation multiple fixed points, oscillations, and even chaos, uh, approximate chaos. Uh, so we tested a few of them. Uh, in 2016, we had tested with radial basis function, showed that its expressive power is strong enough to you know, describe different kinds of decision-making processes and approximate chaos. And more recently, we have delved into uh, the, these gated neural network ideas from artificial neural networks and machine learning, where Gated recurrent units, we explored all of their topological expressive powers uh, in up to 2D. It, in a higher dimension, it's uh, slightly difficult. But we, we understand exactly up to 2D uh, what kind of dynamics are possible. And, and these are very important because these topological structures, having multiple fixed points and having you know, attractors and their, their relation, cannot be mimicked if you don't have expressive power to do it. Uh, but the geometry, exact geometry, doesn't matter too much. Okay, so that's, that's all I'm going to say for here because of, we're short on time. I will switch to uh, one of the models that we have for low D expressive power, and both in terms of uh, its interpretability and, uh, and, and expressive power. So to do so, I'll introduce you to a sequence of statistical models uh, to explain data. The first one is the switching linear dynamics system models, uh, SLDS, where you have x of t, this neural state is evolving over time with respect to this dynamics matrix A. And you have not one, but multiple, but indexed by z of t. z of t is discrete, you can think 1, 2, 3, and the discrete state uh, is transitioning with some probability. If there's some you know, random chance you'll jump from state 1 to state 2, then you'll be using you know, matrix A2 and A1. Uh, it's great for inferring states. So if you have a dynamics that's locally linear, so the green green region you have green dynamics, red region you have you know red red dynamics and so on. But if you simulate from this model, your switching model is just it's Markovian, right? It, do, it doesn't care about where you are. It just switches randomly from red to orange, orange to blue. So your generated data does not look anything like like the real dynamics. This is not really a dynamic system at all. It's some some weird type of uh, trajectory that it produces. So this is not great. And Scott Linderman had extended this to a recurrent model that you can make it local by giving a condition where you're switching from you know, state 1 to 2 depending on where you are in the space. So if you look at the bottom left, uh, you see this blue area. So in the, in the two-dimensional space, you, in this example, you have a hyperplane that Plus into two. If you're in the left side of the hyperplane, then you follow the blue dynamics. If you're not in the blue, then you have another hyperplane. If you're on one side of that, you follow the red, and so on. So in this case, you can uh, to generate data from this model uh, is very nice. It it can create you know uh, consistent dynamical models. But there are a few things that uh, make it difficult. One is that there's this uh, inference using the stick breaking process where the probability of you being on the left or the right are, there's an ordering right so if you're in when you're inferring this model you need to infer which order you're going to cut this and if you want to switch the order between these uh, hyperplane cutting uh, you need to do a lot of inference so the inference gets slower uh, and another thing is that it is not a universal model so the first hyperplane you cut, on the one side of it, it has to be completely linear dynamical systems, right? You, you're never going to refine that part. On, only on the other side, you refine that part. So it's not universal. So what I'm going to show you is our uh, extension of this called the tree-structured SLDS, or TRSLDS, where we're doing the stick breaking in, in a, a symmetric binary tree. So at the root level, you have the full space, same as SLDS, uh, R RSLDS. You split into two, but the difference is when you're splitting into two again, you're splitting both sides. So the baby pink region and the baby blue region are both split into two. We, we, have, we can refine the, the state space repeatedly down, down to smaller and smaller pieces. And in, in this case, we have uh, 
we can we have the opportunity to put uh, dynamical models on each of these intermediate nodes and the root node which we actually do and link them by saying if you if the two uh, nodes share the same parent then you should have similar dynamics so you're trying to smooth out over space using the hierarchy you're trying to smooth uh, across nearby regions so if we do this we get a dynamical system at the root level at the intermediate level and the and the leaf level and you can you know go deeper into the make a deeper tree but i would just like to show you a couple of examples uh, the first one i'll show you is the is the chaotic system the Lorentz system you're probably familiar with if you ask a human being to uh, you know describe the system they will say there are two wings it's sort of oscillating it randomly seems to switch one to another and if you ask if you fit this model with this multi-scale model uh, and ask what's happening in the root node it's going to say oh it's a you know a linear dynamical system it can't do much it just converges to one fixed point but if you ask in the intermediate level where you have two linear dynamical systems explaining it it'll associate one linear dynamical system colored here uh, is orange and blue it knows that there's a you know flat manifold and it's oscillating inside it and you have enough noise such that it switches from one one to another kind of mimicking uh Lorentz. and if you go one step deeper what it does is if you look at the uh, true true uh, dynamics the blue blue line here on, on the green gray it's actually faster on one side when it's oscillating and slower on the other side and what you can see here is that it splits each of these uh, wings into half such that it explains you know red part is fast and the orange part is slow uh, green part is slow and the yellow part is fast right so it splits into detail so it's like giving you a scaled view each of them are linear dynamics so it's easy to understand and it's you get you can zoom into uh, the model deeper and deeper as long as the real system has that kind of structure this would be very helpful in terms of interpreting uh, the dynamics we applied this to uh, a spiking neural net example here uh, which was a winner take all this was a uh, 8000 dimensional system you can you know write down the full differential equation for this but what we've done what we've done here is to take 150 neurons subsample 150 neurons take several trials and and run our inference algorithm to infer the latent trajectory which is shown here in panel d it starts at the red dot it ends up you know half the trials go to this green side uh, blue side and half the dots go to this red side and also simultaneously this hierarchical uh, dynamical picture of of the system uh, the root node is, you know, again, a single fixed point, not super interesting. If you look at the intermediate layer, it starts developing a saddle point here where the trajectories are divided into two sides. And at the, at the second layer, the leaf layer here, with four diff uh, dynamic systems, it does find that there are two stable fixed points that correspond to two of the, each, of, each one of these populations winning and a saddle in the middle, which surprisingly is very similar to what you see uh, from theoretical derivation. So uh, in this 2006 paper, they have reduced this 8,000 dimensional differential equation using time scales and, and, and approximations to down to two dimensional, more understandable uh, effective dynamics. And the, the, the geometry, the topology of the system is exactly the same. You have one saddle in the middle splitting the half and then two uh, stable fixed points. But we did not need to know any of the differential equations all we had were spike trains, 150 spike trains, or I think this was about 1,000 trials. We also applied this to uh, V1 data, where V1 was driven by um, drifting gratings, and the drifting gratings was a periodic signal, which was driving a V1 population in two different ways in this case, and we fit our model. It described each of this drifting grating driving V1 population as two different uh, limit cycle systems. Again split in half and if we simulate from the system it does find these uh limit cycles which cannot happen if you only use a single linear dynamic system you cannot have a you know stable limit cycle but since we are using multiple linear dynamic systems combined it was it was able to uh, produce this uh, generate these uh uh limit cycle dynamics okay so since we're slightly uh, uh, over time i'll just even go faster uh, and show you just briefly what we're doing in terms of uh, real-time systems so 
same inference, the goal is the same. We want to infer the neural trajectory and we want to infer the dynamics underlying it. But the constraint here is that we want to do this in real time, such that it's helpful for you know monitoring uh, neural systems. So if you're an electrophysiologist, let's say you were recording from 1,000 neurons, unlike the old days, you can't listen to you know a couple of neurons and say, oh, this neuron really likes red apples. It's very dizzying, and you, you rely a lot in post-talk analysis, which is very slow, right? But, but if you have this kind of real-time system, perhaps this low-dimensional description of the population will make your experiments uh, tighter in terms of its closed-loopness with the human in the loop, or with a feedback control system, which is, uh, which is uh, automated in terms of this activity. Um, so the problem here in signal processing is called the joint filtering problem. I won't go into the details, uh, but the constraint really is for every time step, you get new data points. So you need to process data points in constant computation, and the total amount of memory you use for these algorithms has to be constant so that you can you know, run this forever. Uh, we have a couple different algorithms that I wanted to tell you about, uh, which I'll just skip the details. We have made a lot of uh, innovations in terms of how we can infer um, accurate distribution over over these uh, states and uh, with uncertainty but i think it's easier if i showed you a couple of examples of how this works so this is a, a data set that we call snowman this is a synthetic data set uh, you'll see why it's called snowman soon it's a hundred dimensional data over this is showing you 500 data points here every time step it receives 100 more numbers it'll never see that data again it doesn't even store it it only sees it, does some computation, and then moves on. I'm going to show you how this looks in real time. Uh, left side is the true dynamical system that generated this data. You can see there's, this, is, this is why it's called a snowman. Uh, the true state is blue x, and the estimated state is uh, the green x that it will try to follow. And in the right-hand side, you will see uh, what the system thinks that the underlying dynamics is as it's learning. So time is on the right bottom. So every time step is only getting 100 numbers. And this is what it's updating. Uh, so it's tightly uh, following the, the, the green X is tightly following the blue X. And it's, you know, it's learning that there's a limit cycle-like structure on the right-hand side. And one, one thing about this algorithm is it's, it can learn how confident it is in terms of its dynamics that it learned. So the greener it is, uh, the more sure it's about its local flow in that in that region, and of course, far away in the bottom, it does not even know the existence of the second uh, limit cycle, and it's very white, meaning it's very uncertain about the dynamics over there. Uh, in this particular case, we're using sparse Gaussian processes to approximate this function. That's why there's a little bit of artifact of this green having some sort of uh, grid-like structure of that that's going. Uh, Finally, reach the other side. Okay, I won't let this run forever. Let's make this round. It'll eventually learn this whole system. Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, this is the last slide. Um, we also built an analog circuit that implements a bistable network. There's no digital component here, so all the noise. In inaccuracies and the dynamics are in the in the circuit. This was our test bed to test our real time system, so we can try to you know estimate the dynamics in real time as well as for perturbation studies, which we are running as we speak. Um, and you know simply we in this uh, diagram here, I'm showing you that we can simulate from the model that we learned in real time. We only looked at 500 time steps from the circuit, and we were able to recover uh, the structure both in the phase space and its uh, generated capabilities. OK, so that's it. I told you a little bit about the about theories, some theory about the misalignment between choice and stimulus representations in MT, uh, our theory about how low-dimensional nonlinear dynamic systems should be used for neural computation and expressive power of different nonlinear dynamic systems. I told you a lot about uh, some methods and technologies that we have developed. Uh, the VLGP, the cross-related choice probability estimator, and uh, real-time inference methods associated with this. With that, I'd like to thank my lab members who worked tirelessly to make this uh, successful. 
and my collaborators on my funding source. Thank you for your attention. Ex excellent question. Uh, um, I anesthetize myself such that I have, you know, brain-wide uh, brain coupled oscillation and very low dimensions. Uh, um, no, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, it's not that all systems are low dimensional, right? But most, most of the sensory, early sensory areas would be very high dimensional, as well as complex memory systems must be high dimensional. So I'm not saying this, this approach of looking for low dimensional uh, dynamics is a solution for all problems. But what it is, is a statistical approach, right? We want to infer things that we can infer. And in my opinion, in the future, we might have more data and more technologies to do so. But at this moment in time, we're at the critical point of getting to real dynamics. A lot of people try to infer dynamics from data for many, many years and from, from data, and it's been very challenging. So we need a lot of assumptions. And in this case, I'm making this assumption of low di dimensional dynamics, which makes sense in a few different areas. One is when the task is, you know, a cognitive task with high, uh, very low complexity such as, you know, with a binary choice task. Th those systems don't have to have, you know, 10 dimensions. You can do it in one dimension. Um, so there, I expect to have good description of an effective one-dimensional theory or two-dimensional theory. Uh, two, there are systems such as anesthesia or, or coma state, where the brain dynamics in, in a more global scale is, is pretty low dimensional. So in those cases, these, these kind of methods would work pretty well. But yes, I, I totally acknowledge the fact that there are many areas that this kind of approach will not work out of the box. Thank you all for listening.